QBI, focusing on image enhancement. Um, for this lecture, we have the guest lecture, Andres Kessler, from uh, Paul Scherer Institute and the SEEK um, Neutron facility for doing imaging. So they have lots of images that they get that require a lot of post-processing so that they can get back to the original information and sample that they're interested in. So it's like the things we went over yesterday, this is a very good example of why these steps are so important and what sort of procedures you should do in order to filter them out. And so I'll let him take over from here and you'll get the slides soon. So. There was actually some internet struggle at home, so I couldn't upload them yesterday, so sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction, first of all, and good morning, everybody. Um, so today's lecture is about image enhancement, uh, which is the part between acquisition and actually analyzing the images. Usually you have to, well, you don't have as clean images as you want. So the outline of today's uh, lecture is uh, first some introduction to the topic. Um, I'm going to talk, spend some words on um, noise and artifacts, then the basic filtering theory, uh, scale spaces is more advanced uh, uh, filtering methods, and then of very important thing is to verify if your filtering is actually performing and producing the results that you want to have. So verification is a part I'm also going to spend some time on. And finally, I'm going to summarize the whole lecture. So in 3D and 4D imaging, we produce large amounts of data. <clears throat> um, so we have a user, happy, got the proposal, we can um, do an experiment, we had three days at the beam line, and uh, afterwards, ouch, we got a lot of data. What now? Um, sometimes it's some gigabytes, other cases uh, it can be even terabytes, and that's a pretty big amount of data to process, and if you don't have a good strategy, you have a problem. And uh, that is actually a condition that uh, I see with many users when they come to us at the beam lines, that they see numbers, maybe, sometimes grayscales, and then they just look like big question marks. And the question is what you want to do with the data. Sometimes it's enough to do some 3D visualization. You may want to characterize the sample or what's happening within the sample in some kind of process. And all that inc is included in the whole processing chain, which I assume Kevin was talking about in the previous lecture. We have different kinds of images. Um, with neutrons, we actually still do about 40-50% uh, radiographs. So we look more at time series of radiographs, single images. Uh, and when we talk about time series, it can actually be thought of as a 3D, because a movie is also a kind of 3D volume. Uh, where the last um, dimension is the time. So that is what you see here. Uh, you have this uh, large block, which is the traditional volume, or else you have a movie where you can follow features within the movie as some kind of three-dimensional structure. The last case is 4D imaging. Then you have a movie of volumes, for example, or you can also have multispectral imaging, where you have, as one component, a spectrum. Uh, if you do a spectrum scan, and all these um, can be processed. And um, actually, I'm going to focus most on 2D and 3D today. The information you want to gain can be either quantitative. You want to actually put, uh, interpret the gray value in each pixel and uh, relate that to, for example, a water content to do some water and material transport. Um, analysis, or else you can look for structures, identifying here we have some kind of structure, here we have another one, and we want to know uh, some um, geometric features, how many they are, for example. And the choice um, how to process the data actually depends on if you want, which kind of information you want. To make the whole more complex, you actually also sometimes would do the combination of the two. So you identify a region, and in that region you want to do an estimate. Unfortunately, our measurements are rarely perfect, so this is what we would expect. 
this uh, circle. And um, that is like that in the real world. Unfortunately, when we measure it, we add some blurring, we have optical components, uh, we have scintillators, and they introduce blurring to the image. Then we have noise, uh, it can be uncorrelated or some kind of texture. I'm going to go into details about that later. Uh, then we have artifacts, we have ring artifacts, we have line artifacts, and everything are baked together into one image, and that is what you see when you do the experiment. And um, this lecture is actually about getting um, uh, the information a little bit better so you can continue the processing. So looking at the whole uh, processing chain, we have the acquisition, produced some kind of noisy data. Then we do some um, enhancement, making it easier to make some decision. Then comes the segmentation. We put the threshold on the data, in, maybe in the histogram or some more um, detailed, um, advanced way. Then we have to do some post-processing because as you see here, there's a lot of misclassified pixels and the post-processing is about cleaning the image out. And finally, we come to the point where we can do the evaluation. Could be some uh, estimation, like the water content in this fuel cell. Could be the distribution of um, soot and ash in a, in a particle filter. Could be uh, water retention curves. So there are many final, different final end results. And, um, the, the further you come in this chain, the more specific you will have um, your um, analysis. So, to this point, it's about the same, but then comes uh, the large differences. Today's lecture will be about the enhancement part. So, I promised uh, noises and artifacts, and uh, that's, I would more define it as the unwanted information. Uh, we have different kinds of noise. We have spatially uncorrelated noise. We have an example here, this Gaussian noise. And uh, then we have the salt and pepper noise. It's also uncorrelated, uh, but has a different characteristic. And then we have the structured noise, which you can see is more smooth or kind of textured. And um, looking at, first of all, the distribution, sim simple distribution-based noise. We have the Gaussian noise, which is additive. Uh, it's a very easy model. It's very uh, gentle to work with if you try to do uh, estimations, um, doing maximum likelihood estimations, for example. For that, the Gaussian noise is very, is very neat. Um, actually, you try to uh, approximate every noise distribution by Gaussian because it's the easiest, more or less. Uh, the reality is that we actually have uh, Poisson noise from our acquisition systems. So it's um, event counting noise and it's more multiplicative. And um, that makes it a little bit more difficult. So for low intensity, you have a different signal to noise ratio than for high intensity. And um, that can be a little bit more tricky. And also the, the modeling of the estimators is also a little bit more complex. So looking at uh, what it, uh, how these uh, noise types uh, behave, you have the Gaussian noise. You can see here that the amplitude of the noise is about the same along this sine curve. And looking at only the noise component, you see that it's more or less the same amplitude, which corresponds to the standard deviation of the noise. For Poisson noise, if we follow this sine curve, you can see up here that um, the noise amplitude is much greater than down here. And you can also see it here that um, the curve and the amplitude, they are getting smaller and smaller. The salt and pepper noise is a kind of outlier noise. And it's um, usually more described by probability of outlier. So if we have a uniform distribution between zero and one, uh, if it's below threshold uh, uh, lambda one, then we set it as minus one, for example. Uh, if it's um, between the two thresholds, then we set it as zero, and uh, beyond, uh, beyond uh, level two, then we set it as a one. And um, then we have the noise fraction as lambda one and two. 
sometimes you don't consider that one, but that's only um, no ice layer or house layer that we have. <coughs> then we have the structured noise. It's uh, first of all spatially correlated. So it's not only a single pixel has its value, but it's also depending on what the neighbor pixels have. And um, one example of, uh, of that is uh, for us, we have a little bit of scintillator structure, which more or less actually looks like this. So if we to produce it, simulate it, you make a convolution of some kernel uh, by the uh, basic uh, Gaussian noise, for example, and then you come in this. You could also have some orient oriented noise. You can see here it has a slanted uh, structure, and then you have to model it, you have a slanted convolution kernel. These actually appear together with the other noise types. So you have, um, usually, you have a mix of Poisson noise, you have um, salt and pepper noise, and you have the structured noise. So it's all in one package. The question is only how strong and how big the impact is of each type. Here are some real images uh, using neutrons. So I did a very short exposure. You can see that it's very noisy. And you can see here on the profile that uh, it's hard to distinguish the first two steps in just this profile. And after a while, you can see that it's easier and easier. Uh, for the longer exposure time, the signal to noise ratio is really good. And then it, it's easy also to distinguish the different levels. If you look very closely, you can even see the Poisson structure of the low intensity case that um, you have a more steep edge on the left side and you have a longer tail on the, on the right side, if you look closely. Looking at the long exposure, you can see that it's turning more and more Gaussian, which is from the rule of the large numbers that everything goes toward the Gaussian. That's also the reason, motivation that why many are using Gaussian models for, for the noise. Signal to noise ratio, I have mentioned it already a couple of times. It is defined as the average intensity in a region divided by the standard deviation of the of that same region. So if you take a small little square here, so that would be the, the way the recipe to uh, compute it, select a small region like out here, compute the average int intensity, and compute the standard deviation in that region. And then you just use either this one, which is just the ratio, or you can also compute it in decibels, and then you compute the logarithm as well out of it. And here you can see um, infinite, I didn't add any noise, and then signal noise ratio 5, 2, and 1. And as you can see, if you have signal noise ratio 1, you have a pretty hard task ahead of you. Normally, we are far beyond that one. So it's somewhere in between this and that. On my overview slide of the acquisition, I also mentioned artifacts, and the typical ones for um, tomography are rings and lines. And the rings, they are caused by mainly stuck pixels um, in, uh, the um, in the data. And when you do the reconstruction, a stuck pixel is always on the same place, and when you reconstruct, it's like if you're turning um, the sample, and then you actually draw a ring in the reconstructed data. And um, usually that is already suppressed during reconstruction, but sometimes it's not possible to take everything away. Maybe the, there are so weak uh, differences in the image that it's hard to actually tune the ring cleaning to, to get everything. The line artifacts is something that occurs very frequently for neutron tomography. Um, when neutrons interact with, with matter, we get one thing, it's either absorbed or scattered. Uh, and the scattered neutrons may hit, um, no, wait, sorry. The absorbed ones, they produce uh, gamma. And this gamma uh, radiation is actually hit in the detector. 
and when the detector is hit by a gamma, you have a spot. And it's only on one single projection. And a spot on a single projection, when you reconstruct it, appears as a line. And if you have many spots, it looks pretty noisy, like this one. You can maybe, if you look at this later, uh, see that there are some lines in this uh, structure, but most of the noise in this one is actually caused by spots. And uh, they, they produce the lines in a kind of haystack matter. Another one which can happen is numerical artifacts, and it could be caused by rounding errors or some kind of unstable processing. Uh, the rounding errors appear when you do processing beyond the precision of the data type you have used. Then you will actually cut, cut off some information and that can give you uh, some uh, artifacts. Actually, it turns out as a kind of noise. And um, the unstable processing, well, that's where the debugging come in. If you have either you have an unstable uh, filtering model or processing model, or actually you have a bug in your, in your, in your um, uh, filter code. Or it can also be just wrong parameterization that the, the filter turns unstable. It could look like something like this. You have a very... Um, uh, you have periodic structures which are not really what you expected in um, in the data. In this lecture, uh, I'm usually working with MATLAB. It's not used in this course very much, but uh, anyway, I wanted to show you a little bit of a list of uh, MATLAB functions that you could use uh, for this part. So you have RAND and RAND N to produce um, uniform random fields or um, uh, Gaussian random fields. You can also do Poisson. Then there are functions for do computing a mean variance and standard deviation, minimum and maximum. They are useful functions that you can use for trying things I showed in, in the first part here. So, now we know that images can look pretty bad. And uh, coming to uh, the basic filtering, so first approach, usually quick methods. But first I want just a little bit uh, a definition. What is a filter? So the general definition of a filter, it's a processing unit that can either or both enhance the wanted information and preferably also suppress the unwanted information. And um, ideally you want that the features are not um, changed beyond recognition because then you have done something wrong, so then you have to do uh, redo the filtering. So it's sometimes it's a bit testing to see which kind of filter does um, actually produce what you want to have. We have different filter characteristics. So in the filter, uh, in, in the data, you have um, fast varying features and you have slow varying features. And if you look at this original image, you can see that there is a pattern here which has a high um, variation rate and there is a slow trend in the background. A low pass filter is suppressing all the fast uh, variations and would ideally leave you with only the smooth trend part of the image. The high pass filter is actually the opposite. So then you take out all the slow variations and you will only have the, um, the rapid variations. And uh, then there's the band pass, which is actually a mix, but I'm not showing it here. It would probably just look confusing. The process uh, or the operator that you use for the linear filters are the convolution operation and um, in principle, you have an image and you have a convolution kernel. And uh, that can be computed either with the in convolution integral or in practice, it's actually done with sums in the computer. If you look at building blocks uh, like the NIME that you are using here, it's more like you have input, some box, which is the filter kernel, and out comes the process data. And looking at different filter kernels, you can design these kernels to produce different results. And typical ones are the mean or box filter, 
this is actually computing the local average value in a region. In this case, I chose uh, 5 by 5. And uh, then I have always the same, and divide by 25. The scaling is depending on how many pixels you have in the neighborhood. The Gauss filter is defined by the Gaussian function. And here you tune the width and the filter strength by uh, the sigma parameter. And um, the discrete um, version of it is that you also place the values in a grid like this. And uh, usually I take uh, values of, of, this, of this region so that you have about 5% of the maximum out in the edges. You can also go to 1%. One percent, but the filter kernel grows pretty fast, and you have much longer execution time. And here you have some um, examples using a mean filter. So we have first on the upper row, you have the original image without any filtering. So the first one was uh, noise-free. Then we add more and more noise, and as you see, it's pretty noisy in the SNR2 version. And apply a 3x3 three three box filter. Uh, you can see that it's a little bit blurrier, but not too bad. And here you can see already on the signal noise ratio 10, you can see, oh, I've got some smoothing. And also here, but it's a little more difficult to actually catch all the noise because they are so much, uh, so strong. And finally, at signal noise ratio 2, I wouldn't say that 3x3 three three is really useful. It's still difficult to distinguish that they have any structures at all. And then I show it also down to 7x7. Seven seven. Uh, then you can see that here the background is relatively smooth, but you have lost all detailed structures. You can even see this in the original noise-free image that you can't even distinguish the two bones of, of the upper arm here. It's just a blur. So that is the problem with um, noise uh, suppressing filters, you can get over smoothing. So you actually destroy information that you want to see. So it's a trade off between reducing the noise on one side and preserving the structures on the other side. As I said, um, how the convolution works, this is a little cartoon showing the principle. Uh, so what you do, you want to filter this pixel, then you take the neighbor pixels, sum them up, and divide by nine, and then this value ends up here, and um, you get a result that is smoother afterwards. And for example, if you would have uh, a Gaussian uh, filter, then you would have to multiply each of these terms with a filter weight computed by, uh, by the Gaussian function. I also told you that um, the larger the filter kernel gets, the longer it takes. You have more elements to compute. For some uh, filter kernels, you can actually use this uh, nice um, uh, laws here. You can do association and commuting um, the different components. And in this case, we can say that uh, a convolved by B first, and then convolved by C is the same as A convolved by B convolved by C. So you can, you can change the order. And that you can use, for example, for the uniform filter, you can use it for the Gaussian filter. You can separate it in one component that is only filtering in the Y direction, and one only in the X direction. And if you have 3D, you can do it in the, uh, that, that direction as well. And that gives you more or less the same result. I say more or less because there are numerical differences, but they are uh, marginal. The gain of doing this is that if you have a three by three filter, then you do nine multiplications and eight additions. And if you would do the separable, you would have six multiplications and four additions. So you see there is already a gain in that. If you go towards the um, the three-dimensional version, then you have 27 multiplications and 26 additions. In the separable case, 
you have come down now to nine multiplications and six additions. And if the filter kernel grows, the gain is uh, steadily uh, increasing. And here you can see the separation of uh, the Gaussian kernel down here. If everybody can see it, it's a bit low. I hope you can see it. And then we come to the median filter. It's not a convolution filter, but it still works on um, a neighborhood uh, like the convolution. Uh, it's also a low pass filter. But what you do is you take out all the pixels in the neighborhood, you sort them, and then you take the median value, the middle one, and place it here. Uh, that has a very good uh, smoothing feature. You can all, it's actually often better in the edge preserving sense. Uh, but there are sometimes, it takes longer time usually. You can't do separable, use separability that easily. But um, it does a pretty good job. So here you can see differences. It's not always that they are good. So if you have salt and pepper noise, as I add in this picture, you see that median actually cancels all of these because it's really ignoring the outlayers. If you try to mean filter the salt and pepper, then you see you just blur it, so you make some kind of uh, um, spatially correlated noise instead of the Gaussian noise that you had in the, had in the beginning. No, no, salt and pepper noise that you had in the beginning. So you're not really gaining anything in that case. If you have additive Gaussian noise, uh, now I use the sigma of 30 in an 8-bit image, and do the median filter, you can't see much difference between them. So it's hard to tell which one is actually the better one. Another type of filters, which I mentioned, is uh, high pass filters. So now we're leaving the smoothing part and looking more at the details of the images. The high pass filters, they um, enhance rapid changes in the data. So it's ideal for edge detection, for example. So the basic one is the gradient. You just take the difference between the two neighbor pixels. You can also do it a little bit more advanced. Depending on how you implement your gradient, there are different recipes. You have better angular sensitivity in, um, in the gradient. Some cases, it's sufficient to use this simple one. Some cases, you really want a good angular, um, angular support um, when you compute the components. Then we have the Lassian it's, and the Sobel. They are both used very much for edge detection. And I'm going to show you the examples of that soon. Uh, first of all, we have vertical edges. So I have an image here, which I filter with first taking, looking at the vertical edges. And you can see here that you have a bright bar and a dark bar. So that's the rising edge and the falling edge. And uh, looking on the horizontal, then you can see that the filter kernel is oriented this way instead. So you have, um, in the lines, you have the filter weights instead of in the columns. And here you can see that from top to bottom, you have horizontal lines now uh, from um, bright for the writing and uh, dark for the, for the falling edge. <coughs> then I said that uh, the Laplacian and Solvold are ideal for edge detection. And first looking at the Laplacian, you see very dark, strongly marked edges here. And the thing is that uh, the Laplacian produce both positive and negative. And uh, when you try to track the edge, you can actually look for zero crossings between the signs. And that is one way of doing the tracking. The other one is using the Sobel filter. Then you have just absolute um, gradients. You get much sharper intensities. So that can, in another sense, be easier for some other algorithms to work with. Until now, I, yes?
Um, it depends from case to case. If you have very weak changes, um, the Sobel has trouble seeing it because it's so smooth um, variation between them. Uh, if you, um, in that case, would look at the sign, you can see that, okay, now I'm crossing the edge point. Other cases, it's easier to work uh, on, the, on the ridges of the absolute am uh, amplitude. So it's a little bit from case to case. You have to have your toolbox of different uh, operators and see which one actually operates the best. <coughs> now I was looking at um, different filters in the spatial domain so you could see what's happening. Uh, next day, step is looking in the frequency space and using the Fourier transform. And what you have, any, any real um, value signal in, in the real space uh, is composed by several harmonics. So as you can see here, I have this very sharp pulse. And this pulse is composed by several uh, frequency components. And um, if you add more and more higher frequencies, you can see in this uh, plot here that uh, this nice blue one, I have many frequencies. And in the green one, I, I think I just, I just use two harmonics. And by increasing the number of harmonics, you can get more detailed information. This is, say, a quick introduction to uh, the Fourier transform. And um, what the math looks like is you have this transform, uh, transforming the real data, which we have here, into the frequency space for two directions. You can also compute its inverse, then the only thing it's actually changing is the sign here um, in the exponent and a scalar factor. These equations, when you work with it, with images, you never see them really. Uh, they are hidden in different toolboxes and uh, libraries, so just say I want the Fourier transform and I want to see the results coming out of it. Here are some um, interesting features of the Fourier transform. So if you have signal A and B, uh, A plus B, you can actually also write it as Fourier transform of A plus Fourier transform of B. And uh, I should try to show this here in this example. You have um, a signal. Uh, this is a relatively uh, mid frequency signal. And um, the, here you have a high frequency signal. And you can see the Fourier spectrum of these peaks. They are pretty narrow to the center, which is around the zero point. So you have, always have one positive and one negative side. For the higher frequency, they come more apart. And if you add the two signals, you will have a signal like this, where you see that they are in the lead. And the spectrum, you now have two peaks. And for the filtering, you may want to take out one of these, so the filter te techniques, they will actually be about removing peaks. Then we come to the convolution. So the Fourier transform of the convolution between signals A and B is the same as the Fourier transform of A times the Fourier transform of B. And, um, the re and that is the one actually used the most. You can go the other way, so if you convolve the Fourier transforms of two signals, then it's the same as if you multiply A and B. But this one is the most important one if you try to do filtering the Fourier space. Looking on real images, I have this uh, balls here, which is our signal, then we have some noise, and what we see would be this noisy image. Looking at the two-dimensional Fourier spectrum, that we have <coughs> some structures telling us we have um, different energies for different frequencies. And uh, looking at the noise, there is an interesting thing about um, the white noise. It's just more or less a constant intensity for all frequencies. And if we combine them, you can see that there is this noise level plus the little peak. So our task in the filtering would be to try to extract that part from that part. And, um, doesn't really look maybe straightforward, but um, you, 
can use, for example, Dino filtering to do that. Um, in this case, the signal noise ratio is pretty bad, so it's probably difficult to actually remove it. I did it that extreme to show you the effect of adding noise in the first place. Another interesting feature of the frequency domain is that you can actually measure orientations. So if you took, make the Fourier transform of this vertical pattern, you will see, oh, you don't see it back there, but there are some bright spots on these positions um, that actually represent the frequency. If you turn the line pattern by 90 degrees, the spots, they are now in the vertical orientation instead. And um, going further, slanting it by 30 degrees, then the spots are actually also slanted. So you can, by that, you can identify different orientations in the image. The 60 degrees is flip, uh, slanting a little bit more. And um, with that, I actually can show you an example from the real world. Uh, in this case, we had stripey uh, projections, and they dis destroyed actually the information in the reconstructed data. What we could see was that these stripes, they are identified by energies along this line here, pretty close to um, uh, the vertical um, frequency axis. So my solution was to create a filter with this very specific shape and multiply by that. And afterwards, when I do the Fourier transform back, I had by that suppressed uh, the stripey information pretty much. And um, the effect of it, that was before. You see there is a background trend that was really annoying for the segmentation. And after the filtering, we turned up with that. Then we have, again, some MATLAB functions. Um, filtering, convolution. Uh, filter 2 is doing the 2D filtering. Midfield is doing the medium filtering. Then we have the Fourier transform parts. And uh, then um, looking at angles, we can take the absolute and the uh, angle of uh, the frequency component. And since the Fourier transform produces um, complex valued uh, information, we can also look at uh, the real part and the imaginary part if you like. Now I have, um, let's see if I can, that's no, wrong. I think I just have to go out a little bit and change to that one. I have a little example also how you can work with filters. Um, oh, there it is. I was mentioning that uh, spots produce lines and they are really a problem for micron imaging. And here I have an example that um, from a real case. This is um, a knot of some metal uh, rods. And uh, what you can see here are these spots and streaks in the data. Uh, the amount and size of these uh, spots and streaks depends on scintillator, exposure times, um, and uh, it varies from experiment to experiment. Also, sample composition can have an effect on it. So, the solutions to do this would be, first of all, just to take a low-pass filter. It smooths the whole image, so it's not good. The medium filter, well, it takes out the out layers, but also that one has a smoothing effect on the whole filter. The other way would be to detect the spots and replace them by some estimate. Um, that is actually what I'm trying to show here. Could be an exercise for you afterwards if you like. The algorithm for doing the spot screening is um, first of all, you have the original image, you media filter it, and you get a smooth image. But we don't want that only. Then you subtract the medium from the original, take the absolute, and then what comes out are actually the spots on the loop that uh, are in the image. Then we do some thresholding, can be done in different ways, um, and we come up with um, a spot map 
and uh, with a spot map we can create a replacement information. Here we have the reverse spot map and the original information. And at the end we add the two of them and we have a cleaned image. Comparing the different um, approaches, you can see that um, having this original with the box filter, you can see there is a lot of blurring, and in the difference between original and box, you see a lot of information is actually still there. The medium filter well, looks spot free, no direct artifacts, but you can also see that it takes out some of the noise, could also be even edges in the data. And uh, the cleaning algorithm I showed you um, actually is like the original, but without the spots. That is an example how you can combine different filters. If you're working with ImageJ, uh, don't use this speckle because it, that's just another name for medium, nothing else. And then there is the remove out layers, which is the one um, I showed you, more or less. And see. Um, I don't know, what, what is the routine for breaks? We do it, we want to take a break because this is a good place. <laughs> okay, let's take some minutes to get some fresh air and then we continue afterwards. <laughs> 